Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. I think when we start, you're thinking, okay, it's going to be one, two, three. And it, it generally doesn't go as one, two, three, really. <laughs> <laughs> it end up going one, five, one, zero, right. back, you know, and you're like, ah, you start swimming. But it is at the same time the most fulfilling thing to do. Mm. And there's again, as I said earlier, knowing why you're doing something, that's what's going to make you wake up in the morning right. and push. Knowing the reasons that will make you wake up and push. Because money cannot be that one. Right. Because money, it's a, it's a non-negotiable. You have to make money. That's, that's non-negotiable. Right. But what is it? Hey everyone, you're listening to Item 13, a bi-weekly podcast covering everything African food. And I'm your host, Yom Tego. Every other week, we'll delve into the world of African food chefs, curators, and bloggers. I hope you enjoy it. Anyone who knows me well knows how much I love wine, and my appreciation for all things wine was further enhanced during my two-year stay in South Africa, which is why I'm thrilled this week to be speaking to Nsike Biela, South Africa's first black female winemaker. Nsiki grew up in a rural village in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Having spent a year as a domestic worker, she was awarded a scholarship to study winemaking in 1999. She graduated from Stellenbosch University and joined the boutique wineries Delakaya Wines the following year. Nsiki's ambition to create her own wines grew following a collaboration with Californian winemaker Helen Kiplinger as part of the Wine for the World initiative. She has consulted in France, making wine under the winemaker's collection in Bordeaux. Nsiki is also on the board of directors for the Pinotage Youth Development Academy, which provides technical training and personal development for young South Africans in the Cape Wine Lands, preparing them for work in the wine industry. The program offers them the unique opportunity to emulate her own considerable success. Here's our conversation. Welcome to the show, Nsiki. It's really great to have you on. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no, this, this should be great. I'm a big lover of wine, and I think I shared with you that I lived in South Africa for a little bit, and so it's 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 actually an honor for me to to speak with you as being the the first Black female master winemaker in South Africa, and just my experience of wine in South Africa not being particularly Black, and so will be interesting to hear your take on on, on that whole um, situation, I guess. So I wanted to start first with talking about you, you know, your background. I think you have a fascinating background story. And so if you could share that with people. I know you grew up in KZN. So how did you, you know, from growing up in a rural area in KZN, KwaZulu-Natal, sorry, for people who don't know, um, to ending up in, in Stellenbosch, you know, studying wine? Uh, well, first, I'm just going to say I'm glad that you're a wine lover. Those are kind of people who keeps us working. Because yeah. um, if there's no wine lovers, like who would make wine for? So that is actually, that's great. Um, 
as we've said, I'm from Wazulu Natal, actually. Uh, I'm, it's, I'm from the deep rural areas, like literally rural areas where when you think of um, source of information, you have to literally go somewhere else to get it. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, there, there's no easy access to things. There's no easy access to things that people, when you're in the city, that they take for granted. Right. And we don't have that easy luxury of having that access as as, as other people uh, do. Um, I guess it's like in any other rural area, really, um, in, in, if you look in, the con- in our continent. Yeah. Um, so through the scholarship of South African Airways, I was one of the people who were recruited from high school. But the recruitment didn't specifically appoint me. It was more like the teacher saying, I've got two application forms for someone who wants to study in Stellenbosch, do wine making. And I raised my hand. And that was basically <laughs> the first start. It was okay. like, oh. And then I applied. And I remember the first application forms came and they were in Afrikaans. And oh. in Wazulu Natal, we basically, we don't, uh, Afrikaans is not one of the languages right. that we truly, you know, mm-hmm. you, you learn it in school, but it's like you're learning Afrikaans in Zulu in a way. Right. Uh, so, and so we basically, we, 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 we applied then, and then uh, after my application, um, I got accepted at the university, and I got a call from South African Airways that were obviously were interviewing me at that right. time. But it was now a year later because with the first application, um, I didn't get any feedback, and then with my second application, I got a feedback. But at that time, I was already working in Durban as a domestic worker. Oh, um, so which was. For me, going there to work as a domestic worker was like basically what do you call it? It was more like um, changing a position, you know, yeah. you are here and you want to change your life. So, mm. change position and whatever came as a sign of possibility that I can change something, then I changed. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, um, then when SIA told me that the lecturers were in Afrikaans and whatnot, it was one of those things that didn't fade me. I was like, oh, yeah, no, I'll learn. But it was the, 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 the idea of saying I'll learn was based on the fact that actually I did not understand what they meant. <laughs> Until I got to Stellenbosch. And I was like, oh, damn. This is what they meant when they said it's going to be in Afrikaans because I had no clue what was being said. So everything that you, you, know, you were studying was, was in Afrikaans, really? Yeah, it was in Afrikaans. So we had to actually um, uh, ask for tutors. Oh, one in English and one in Afrikaans? Is that sort of how you managed or? No, we had to get, because what happens is we go to the class and um, you go to the class and then you basically listen because there are words that are said in Afrikaans which you cannot change uh, they are more translated from English okay so you just just to see where the lecturer is because there were books the books were in English we'll get the English books but then we can't get the notes the Afrikaans oh, students yeah. get them. so we'll have the book um but you and the lecture is in Afrikaans so you're reading in an English book trying to see where the lecturer is <laughs> Oh man, that sounds. And this was just around. Around what time was this, right? Around this was well, just after happened. Ninety nine, two thousand to two thousand and three. Okay, got it. And and okay. I read somewhere that you so you were given this bursary to study um, wine, I guess, and you didn't. You hadn't even tasted wine before. Didn't know anything about wine. <laughs> nope, absolutely not. So what was what was your family's reaction to you leaving? leaving home to go and study, first of all, in Stellenbosch, an Afrikaans country, and then to study wine of all things? Well, at the beginning, they didn't know really what I was going to like. Okay. It. I remember one of the um, grandfathers in the village, because he knew that it's what I'm doing, it's got to do with agriculture. He was like, out of everything, you thought we should go study agriculture, something that we do in the at home. <laughs> like, it's like, really? <laughs> Why don't you do... A clerk work because that's the better you right. know work in but you know how all the older people think then you know and yeah. which I, I if i were to look back i would have said maybe i agree because you know when you're growing up and you're thinking agriculture our 
So, <laughs> so yeah. And, um, but as they find out that obviously what I was doing and um, one of the things that my mom was concerned, obviously, you know, alcohol and, and us, right. you know, it's like, oh, my child's going to be an alcoholic, you know, <laughs> you, you know how we, I think as, as, um, as the continent, you know, right. the sort of experience that we have struggles with alcohol and especially, you know, we've got struggles with alcohol. It's, we cannot deny the fact that people overdo stuff. Right. And yeah. messes our lives and whatnot. So it is a fear of a parent when they, their child starts drinking. Okay. So, and so she was concerned. Okay. And I was like, no, actually, I'm tasting, I'm speaking. When she saw me for the first time on TV, she's like, you didn't speak, I saw you. And I was like, I speak, it was on television. So they, they didn't show that part. And she was like, I saw you drinking. That's so interesting. And I'm actually surprised that that was sort of, um, I mean, yeah, that's part of the reaction. But I also wondered if they were concerned at all that you were going into, um, you know, a predominantly male, white dominated field, especially in post apartheid South Africa, you know, just immediately following apartheid. Well, I don't think, um, I don't think my. Because I was from the rural areas, they didn't actually know anything about what's happening in Stellenbosch. Interesting. That, you know, they, they, they didn't know. And I personally didn't know, really. Oh, okay. Until I, yeah, because <laughs> so, yeah, it's like almost, I, I, from my ex, at least limited experience, you know, like my closest experience with KwaZulu-Natal was Durban. And like, I think even that, I guess the experience there versus Stellenbosch is, is night and day. So I guess it's, maybe it's a good thing you didn't know <laughs> what you were. I had no idea. Into, in Absolutely had no idea. So, so then you graduated from from you know from studying agriculture, wine. Um, so, what was your next step then? How did you sort of find a job in the field? And you stayed in Stellenbosch, right? Yes. So, uh, well, after graduating, I then applied um, for jobs. And one of the first jobs I applied for, one of the companies, they told me they were looking for a guy, not a woman. Uh, it was a viticultural job. And I literally cried myself to sleep because I thought, like, this is, like, first and foremost, it's wrong to say you can't have somebody because they're of of their gender, right? And that was already official. Well, that is wrong. You don't do that. So I was like, so do you mind, guys? Can't you send this to me on email? You know, trying to be smart. (laughs) Like, no, but we've told you. (laughs) We can't. And I was like, ouch. Okay, so, um, but I applied for a job and I got hired by Stella Kaya Wines as their junior winemaker, which was the best place for me. Mm. So I, I don't want to lie. Like, you know, when they, when you look and say, you know, certain things are just meant for you. Yeah. Um, I realized, with, you know, the work of God in a sense that right. um, they declined my position on the other side. Because that wasn't going to actually take me where I, where right. I, I was supposed to be. And the position of being at Stella Card took me exactly where I was supposed to be. Because I had to work in the vineyards all the way to the cellar, all the way, basically the whole value chain, mm. and be involved with the market and understand the whole business. No, that's so, great. Yeah, and I, I actually am one way, of those people that believe yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> and in that way, it gave me the platform to be able to and the and, and the education of understanding of of being able to run my own business. Yeah, no, I I agree, and I actually maybe then let's talk about um, your business. Actually, before we talk about your business, I want to understand like what's the difference between when someone says you're a winemaker, what does that mean? Because I think more people are at least on the consuming side are more familiar with the sommelier. But who is a winemaker, and how is that different from from a sommelier? Okay, winemaker is a person basically who makes the wine. Um, they it generally are really qualified or it's from experience, but they basically physically make the decision of when to harvest, what happens on the wine, how to crush it, how to press, when to press, oh. what to be added, choose the barrels, uh, when the wine should be bottled, do the blending, all that whole process until it gets to the bottle. 
Interesting. It's almost like a chef for wines, so right? Coming up with yep. a recipe for what the wine is going to taste like. Oh, wow. You know, I did. I actually didn't even think that was a thing. Oh, interesting. So you got to do that and also learn about the business. That's great. So then you were there for over 10 years and decided you wanted to start your own you know, yes. your own wine business. So tell us about Aslina Wines. First of all, like, why is it called Aslina? So I decided to name the company after my late grandmother. Oh, okay. Because, you know, to honor the the woman, to honor the hero was behind everything that I became. It was the strength and the pillar mm-hmm. and the love of. So, yeah. Okay, so then um, tell us about Aslina. So you, you've you been working at Selakai for, you know, 10, 12 years or so, I think I read. And then you just, oh, yes. why did you decide it was time to do your own thing? Well, since I started working, I knew that the, the goal was to make my, start my own company. Oh, okay. So it was a matter of time. And as I was working, I knew that, you know, you don't do something unless you've got your own, ex- you've got the right experience, get the right. right things in place. So as much as I had all the knowledge and everything else, except the funding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that wasn't going to stop me because clearly it doesn't look like anything has stopped me so far. Right. Um, so I then uh, decided when it was time, um, I think also, there are a couple of things that made me also even to realize it is time, you know. Mm. Um, when I started the collaboration with an American winemaker, okay, Kaplinga, which was through Wine for the World, as I was um, doing a, um, uh, as I was working with Helen Blending to work with Wine for the World for exports. Yeah. And from there, I did a consultation in France, which was for the winemakers collection. And then after that, I got invited by the state's department for the African Women Entrepreneurship Program. And I think that last one was basically um, sort of a graduation, a a finalizing thought or um, what do you call it? It was more like after you are dressed up and just to put that belt on to say, yeah, get uh, this is the time. Because... First and foremost, when I looked at the women I was among that was invited with, they all owned businesses, multi-million dollar businesses all over Africa. To um, what was was being discussed there is like how to do exports, what do you do? No, it was more about business. Yeah. And listening to the struggles of other women in Africa who till today and just to realize that till today, there's still countries that because you are a woman, yeah. you cannot in a bank account, you cannot, it has to be written under with the name of your husband. Who's got absolutely <laughs> no clue what you're doing? Who's got no idea? Right. You came with everything, but you can't, you, you know, stuff like that. And I was like, but they're still doing it. They don't let those things stop them. They yeah. run proper businesses. Right. And... You know, so with that and uh, meeting, networking with, making friends and networking with um, all these women and making friends with others. And there was an intervention that also happened among the friends I've made. (laughs) Um, I had made, I made friends with uh, Vava from uh, Vava Coffee in Kenya. And there was... um, Emmy from the Gambia, and there was Leticia from Zim. There was a lady from Nigeria. There was someone oh, from wow. Malawi. Like a Pan-African, Pan-African. Uh, yes, yeah, but basically it was a, like you know when you an intervention. Yeah. They called for. They said, "Let's go and have a glass of wine." <laughs> As, and they, they made sure that whatever came out of their mouth shook me. So much that I was like, okay, oh, wow. I, hate, I hate you. Yeah, this is the, the turning point where you have to do something now. It was a turning point. Yeah, and then we had another lady who was speaking there at, the, at, the, at, the, at the, one of the seminars that they were organized. And she said, when you're starting your, a company, you must know why you want to do it. Mm-hmm. What is that that make you wake up in the morning? Because it cannot be money. 
Right, yeah. And I realized that what took me so long was because I had forgotten. Not really forgotten. You know when you know why you wanted to start something, but then it goes behind. Right. It gets the haze, and then it gets com- covered because you're busy with other things. Right. And then it gets slightly ignored. So that what had happened. Okay. And because that had happened, um, yeah. Interesting. So, well, I'm glad you decided to, all those people pushed you into going into wine because I, I've also heard the story of you winning and, you know, at least when your grandma was alive, you're able to take home, you know, an award for your wine and sort of her reaction was not what you expected. Yes, yes, yes. No, it was definitely not. It was like when she tasted it. I, that was, but for me, that was one of the most exciting wine moments, because she tasted the wine, and she was like, "It's nice," and the facial expression was just saying, <laughs> "But I just, you know." So yeah. Oh, cool. All right. I think this is where we can take a natural break, and then when we come back, we'll do. For sort of the because of the range of our audience, I wanted us to go back into you know a crash course in wine, you know the ranges of whites and reds, and also talk about your product line, um, and then a little bit more about the business, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Okay. Okay, so now I wanted to do, for those who are not wine lovers like me, <laughs> I wanted to sort of give people, um, lay the foundation of, you know, what... Because I think people tend to be... People that don't drink wine or are not as into are intimidated by um, the whole process of wine. It seems like a process of wine drinking, right? Um, yeah, it's a ceremony. <laughs> yeah, it's like there's the whites and the reds and all the fancy names, and then you have to swirl and all this stuff. And so I think it, people can find that a little bit intimidating. So I wanted us to make this easy for for people. Let's let's get people into wine. So um, I don't even know where we let's let's start with you know the difference between whites and white and red white and red wines. Yes. Okay, the difference between the white. Okay, one. Um, the red wine, the color comes from the skin of the grapes. Yeah. So both grapes have got white juice, um, except there's few, about two or three grapes that got red color that are red, that that juice is red. Okay. But generally, the juice of the grapes is white. But then, when it comes to the red wine, we get the color of the of the of the of the wine from the skin. Because with the reds, we ferment it. We, as we make the wine, we ferment it with the skin to get that color. So that's what gives white, you that rich red color, yeah. Yes. While with the white wine, we don't have to ferment with the, the with, with the skin. But even if you were to ferment it with the skin, you're not going to get the red color. Right. <laughs> and, and in, in South Africa, is where I dis- I didn't know this before. It's where I discovered this pinotage for the first time. <laughs> Yes, because you know. it's our own, our own, our own, our own grape varietal, oh, okay, which was it. crossed between Pinot Noir and Pin and Hermitage, okay. which is also known as Cinso. Interesting. So, you know, I know there's all sorts of ranges of wine, and and we could spend forever talking about it. So, I want to focus on the the product range that you have at Athlina, and then maybe help people you know, differentiate between what those are and even maybe talk about how you pair that with, with food, especially maybe African food. So I know you have a Chardonnay, a Sauvignon Blanc, a Car- Carbonet Sauvignon. Yes. Um, so maybe let's talk about what the difference. Cause those there's are the last pre- one you didn't mention. I'm trying to find out why. Um, <laughs> because I cannot pronounce it. I think Umsa Sane, Umsa Sane. A Bordeaux? Yes, it says yes. it's a Bordeaux. Yes. <laughs> you just pronounce it nicely. Um Sasan. Um Sasan. A, yes, yes. And that is a Bordeaux blend. Okay. Uh, just to tell you about that, because as I said earlier, the the, na- the, the company is named after my late grandmother. Mm-hmm. So that wine, Um Sasan, which is a Bordeaux blend, it's a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Petit Vedo. Okay. The reason behind the name is one, the, the Um Sasan, it's a, the Akasha tree. So, umsasana oh, okay. is a word for the akasha tree. Mm, okay. 
and the acacia tree is an iconic tree in right. the continent, yes. continent Africa. Um, but the reason behind the the name landing on the bottle was because it's my grandmother's nickname. Oh. So, yes. So it is my grandmother's nickname. And so I thought actually that was going to be... That's a great way to pay homage to her, yeah. Yes. That's great. So... Um, so then, if you let's if we talk about a Chardonnay and a Sauvignon Blanc, which are both white wines, like what's the difference? What's the primary difference? So if I go to a restaurant and, and you know I'm odd, I'm offered white wine and they say, oh, we have a Chardonnay and a Sauvignon Blanc. How do well, I decide? the difference is just on their food character, um, the flavors and the characters of each wine. They all have. They're like I'm like I always say they're like human beings. They've got different personalities <laughs> okay. and different characters. So when you look at the the, 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 the the Sauvignon Blanc, you'll get, depending on where it's planted, because um, you can get either it's going to be a warm climate one or a cool climate. Cool climate is going to give you more of the fresh aspar- asparagus, freshly cut grass and all those. While when you look on, tro- on, on the warm climate, one, it will give you more of the tropical fruits. Um, you'll get more of the warmer fruits. So what happens is then... Um, in terms of to differentiate between the Sauvignon Blanc and the Chardonnay, again, as I said, it's characters. Even when it comes to winemaking technique, people they know Sauvignon Blanc is one of those like fresh, crispy wines. Yeah. You barely find Sauvignon Blanc being wooded, but now people have started doing that also with the Sauvignon Blanc. While with the Chardonnay, you'll find Chardonnay being wooded, being a bolder, bigger wine. But again, you pay, pick up more of the some um tropical fruits on the on, on, on the on the on the Chardonnay. On the Chardonnay. Being uh, wooded meaning that it's kept in a wooden barrel. What does being wooded mean? Wooded it means it's being kept in wood in, in wooded barrels. Okay. Yes. Yes. So you'll find some Chardonnay will be wooded and some will be unwooded and some will be partly wooded. Um so they are, you find that most of Chardonnay is more they'll be more they've got more bigger body and more depth than yeah. Sauvignon. Yeah. And then in terms of pairing it with food, would you say like the standard sort of, um, I guess, you know, what people consider standard is like whites going with, you know, chicken, fish, poultry, and red going with more like meatier stuff is, is the way to go? Or are you of the school of thought that you can drink whatever wine you want with whatever you want I, to eat? <laughs> I, I'm, all, I'm of this thought that you can drink the wine with whatever you feel like. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And two, that actually you can actually pair the because when it comes to pairing, it's all about the sources. It's all about what mm. you, how you make something. All I can say is that when you've got a heavy meal, yeah. you can go not go for the light wine because it's gonna overpower the wine. Oh, okay. So when you've got like you can you can have if you, like Chardonnay, if it's a big bold wine, yeah. you can have yeah. that wine with something a heavy meal. You okay. don't have to have. I- what with fish or right. chicken, you can have it with anything. Okay. Um, example, um, you can have fish actually with red with red wine. Oh, if you, if you had to have game fish like the Dorado, or you have that game fish, you can have it with red wine. Okay, but it's a it's a it's more of a what stronger fish, stronger more meaty. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you can't um and 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 one of the things I've I've realized with the time that I've been working with wine. Um, you know, when you talk about spicy food yeah. and yeah. red wine, it's like it's a no-go area. I once had chicken curry <laughs> with a merlot. <laughs> it was the most beautiful pet meal I've ever had. Yeah. And I've never managed to do it again. Oh, really? So, yep. <laughs> yeah. So, no, and I, I don't think it's really how you do it. In right. The yeah, I, I agree. So it's all about experimenting. Yeah, I agree. It's like like you said, yeah, it's it's like food, you know. What whatever brings out the best flavor as you're eating, I think I think works. Um so then I wanted to go back into that business of wine a little bit more because I'm still um you know, you've won all these awards and like, you know, we just reading about your story and all the things you've accomplished is great, but I think for those listening, I really want them to appreciate like 
you know, the sort of social, political, cultural background in which you're doing all of this and still managing to succeed, right? So even as, you know, you're being pushed by, you know, all these people in your core group of network to go do this because you have expertise and you've always wanted to do it, I can only imagine, like, how, and I'm just making assumptions here, but how challenging that must, you know, must have been to to go out on your own in, in, in a world where you don't see people that, you know, look like you and, you know, that you don't have a trailblazer. So you are the trailblazer in, in, in that sense. And so I wonder how you, you go through all of that and how you figure out, obviously your experience helps, but from more of um, uh, an emotional like character, how do you sort of push yourself and will yourself through some of the challenges of doing this for the being a ground, you know, breaker for the first time? Well, I think when it comes to, like now in the business, there are other um, people of color who actually own wine companies. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, they are, and uh, who started their companies long before me. And the only difference is that I'm a winemaker. Well, I started as a winemaker. Okay. Um, but there are people who have companies. And the, 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 I think the struggle of navigating a business being on your own as an entrepreneur, that's what I can talk about mm-hmm. in, this, in the sense that, you know, it's, we tend to, I think when we start, you're thinking, okay, it's going to be one, two, three. And it, it generally doesn't go as one, two, three, really. <laughs> <laughs> it end up going one, five, one, zero, right. back, you know, and you're like, ah, you start streaming. But it is at the same time the most fulfilling thing to do. Mm. And as again, as I said earlier, knowing why you're doing something, that's what's going to make you wake up in the morning and right. push. Knowing the reason is going to make you wake up and push because money cannot be that one. Right. Because finally, it's a, it's a non-negotiable. You have to make money. That's, that's non-negotiable. Right. But what is it that, that makes that's you wake actually up? A good, that's actually a good, good, good way to put it. I've never heard it put quite that way before the, the money is a no no it's almost like okay that has to happen so it's not the the reason to, to, to do this so, you know it's like it's, it's not that was yeah. that has to happen it's yeah. like if it doesn't happen then it's like why are you doing why it? Do- that <laughs> but what is the reason behind yeah. that what's what's making you wake up in the morning to go and do yes. this yeah. Ah, yes. yeah so um i think um what has helped me though is one I don't usually I don't look at stumbling blocks as stumbling blocks mm. really. I look at all these challenges as oh well it's just something that is giving me strength to be able to to push more and get more strength. Right. And then I you know and two I focus on people who bring positive um energy other than people who are being negative. As as difficult as the industry is um, I have navigated and made friends within the industry yeah. and even inside the industry. And I was, re- I'm really, I was reading one of the books uh, by Paolo Coelho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it about the list? No, it's um, what's the name of the book? Uh, it's the Zahir. Okay. It speaks about the bank, and the bank for me is. He speaks about the network that you create mm. as a bank. That's that's what he calls the bank. It's uh, the network. Okay. Calling it the bank, you deposit into the bank, and you. Interesting. Yes, yeah, so you do. You deposit in the bank, and you can withdraw from the bank. And so, for me, that is actually what I think um, has helped me. Is that depositing in the bank was to make all these friends and assisting while I could, and now I can withdraw. At the same time, try and deposit in the banks. Yeah, that's also an interesting oh nuggets. I need to check out that book because that's an interesting way to also you know look at it and think about as you know if people are listening that you know are trying to th- go into their own businesses or into any sort of venture, really thinking about that networking process as a as a bank. Yes, a good, yeah, a he good calls metaphor. it the favor bank. The favor that's bank. That's a good good metaphor. Um, the favor. So for for me, I think I have built relationships. Mm. I, have, you know, um, 
Well, one of the things I, I talked to, because uh, I'm involved, I'm one of the directors at the Pinota Youth Development Academy. Yeah. And one of the things I tell the students is like, you know, when you're walking, when you meet that person, it is important you build bridges everywhere you go. Build bridges. It does not matter whom you meet. It. Build bridges. Spread the love. That is the key. Yeah. Spread the love. Because when you spread the love, love comes back. Love comes back. That's just that. Wow, you give love, love. A good, love and... <laughs> that's a good and... philosophy to live by. And and for these young people, I'm guessing this uh, academy, it's you teaching young people, it's preparing young people for to work in the wine industry, with Pinotage. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's the wine industry and the hospitality. Okay. So I, I think with that, like I, I've got mentors whom I sometimes pinch myself, how did I get this mentor to mine? <laughs> like, how did that happen? And these mentors, they volunteer. They go, oh, yeah, I'll mentor you. I'll assist you. And they spend their time making sure that I do it. Like, it's just, it's, it's amazing. It, yeah. it, 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 it overwhelms me. It's, I'm grateful. You know, it, it, it makes me humble. And to realize that as much as I think I'm like, oh, how am I going to do this? But there's this, there are these people who always say, you know what, we're rooting for you. And there are people, some of them I don't, one thing I know is that I've got people I don't know who are rooting for me. Yeah. We're definitely and, rooting for you over here. So. so thank you so much. And it's always, it's amazing. It's amazing. And I'm grateful yeah. all the time. Please, you know, so yeah. Um, so I also wanted to ask, uh, we'll, we'll do a rapid fire question segment, but before we do that, I wanted to ask you sort of what you see is next for Faslini Wines. Are you planning to go international, um, wine bar maybe? <laughs> what sort of things we, are we, you... we, we are already international. But oh, where are you? Let people it's... know where they can find you. So what we're working on now, we're working, we need to have a, a house of Aslina, a home of Aslina. Okay. Company needs a home, it has to have a home. And currently, because we're renting and doing this, but we okay. need to have a home. And currently, we're exporting our wines to the USA. Okay. Uh, so, in Texas, we are in New York, New Jersey, nice. DC, um, DC, Virginia, Maryland, right? Yeah, That's a DMV, trip, yeah. The triplets. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Boston, <laughs> um, uh, Rhode Island. Um, oh, nice. I'm in New Jersey this weekend, actually, so I, I need to go find. I should look, yeah, I should look this weekend to see if I can find. You, you can check if you just to get the places that's got the wine, you can email Mika at winefortheworld.com. Okay, and we'll do that to find. And then, are wine you anywhere the else? They are on my website. Okay. To see that. The email address. I what think, about yes. on, on the continent? Are you just in South Africa? I am in South Africa. We are in Ghana. We are in Swaziland. Oh, and Ghana. we are awesome. moving to Zambia soon. Uh, do you know where in Ghana you are? Because we have a lot of listeners from Ghana. Uh, it, sure. I don't know where we are yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but all that information is on, on your website, right? Yes, if okay. they, they can, they could, on my website it says Ghana and then it's got Veronica's email address okay. who is right. presenting us in Ghana. So, um, but also there's a possibility that I'm going to be in Ghana in November. So, Oh, great. Yeah. That, that, that will be, uh, keep me posted. Well, I think I'm in Ghana in December actually. But yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch and see what happens. And then where we keep saying your website, it's, it's www.asinawines.com or... What is what is the website? What yes, dot com. Okay. Okay. Dot co dot z a. Both of them they link as one. Okay. So www.aslinawines dot com. Okay. Awesome. All right. So we I typically end the interview with a rapid fire, what I call a rapid fire segment, where I just ask a quick question and you tell me off the top of your head like what they answer. They're super oh, easy. Oh goodness. <laughs> super <laughs> easy questions. This is five or six super easy questions. So. Okay. Um, let's hear, let's, let's go. And because we're talking about wine, so let's start with, um, what do you prefer essentially, red or white wine? Red. Um, coffee or tea? Tea. Uh, sweet or salty? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Mostly salty. 
Yeah. But there's that phase where I literally go on a rampage of sweets. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then hmm, let's see what do you think of this one. Durban or Cape Town? Durban. Oh yeah, even even though you live now in like on like a Western I'm, Cape. I'm, <laughs> for in every country or place I go to, for me it's about the people really yeah. then that makes me home compared to the area. To to the place. Yeah. Um not that Cape people Cape people in Cape Town don't make me home. If I were to say tell you, I'm from Wazul Natal. Yeah. And yeah. when I went to Italy, I said Italy could be my second home. Because <laughs> the experience there felt like I'm among the Zulu people. Yeah. yeah. Like with the, the the lifestyle. In Italy where I walked, people were not passing without greeting me. They were not passing without asking mm. you a stupid question. Like a guy would ask you a stupid question, what is the time? And you're thinking, who doesn't have a cell phone that's got time <laughs> nowadays? You know? But that's their pickup line. And in case at end, that's what happens. There's a, <laughs> that you do not pass a lady. If you're a guy, you don't pass a lady without yeah, complimenting yeah. her or saying something to her. And that's how Wazulu Natal is. Yeah. And because of that, like Cape Town for me is more European. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um... And then, what's your favorite South African meal? I love pap. Oh, yeah. And dumplings. Um, and then, uh, if you could live on one dish for the rest of your life, what would that be? I would like to say amasi, but the problem is they affect my stomach now. So, I, I wouldn't mind to live on pap with any sauce all the time. <laughs> okay. Can <laughs> you definitely like pap, yeah. I, I can live on that because yeah. I can make it in different ways. Okay. Make it stiff pap, make it put up. pap. Wait, oh. you can make pap in... So, interesting, actually. So, I'm going to sort of come back. How do you make pap in different ways? I've only had pap, like, the one way. The stiff pap? Yeah. Okay, then you can make it... Because you use a maize meal, you can make it to put to where it is more granular. Okay. Which you want to eat with a masse or you can eat with a sauce. Interesting. Um, I've seen some people making it with um, make the stiff pap and then making them as if you're making lasagna, but do oh, it wow. as a pap instead of doing putting a lasagna shit. And those things would be actually good for people who are gluten intolerant. Interesting. I did not so see nice. my, my South nice. African friends are holding back on me. Yeah, when I lived in when I lived in SA, because I only had it the one way. Oh, that's good to know. I need to look into so, yeah. this. Yeah, good. So, uh, that is what I can live on. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, thank you, thank you so so much for your time. This this was enlightening. It's such an honor to speak to you and to hear your story. Um, yeah, and I hope like as people listen and hear about your story, they're inspired to go out there and do their own thing and that they, they go out and look for us, you know, why you're international. So hopefully people can find you uh, in the U.S., in Europe, uh, in Ghana, wherever wherever it is that you... And I'll put the links to your website and social media so people can also find it when the interview comes up. Okay, thank you so much. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Item 13, an Essence 13 production. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. To keep up to date on news and events from Essence 13, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Essence and the number 13. Thank you.